We're going to be talking a little bit about the maturation of the crypto market infrastructure. And for those of you who are repeat Multicoin Summit attendees, you might have noticed we like doing this panel specifically. Uh, because the point is to, to show you how the market infrastructure is evolving over time. You know, we don't really think a snapshot is really that interesting. We think what's more interesting is showing you the trend line and how things are changing. So I'm really happy and excited to be joined on stage by Greg Tussar and Matt, Matt Balanswig from Tagomi and Genesis Capital, respectively. So thank you both for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just to start it off and warm up a little bit, uh, do you guys want to tell us a little bit about your background, what you've done before, and then what brought you into crypto? Um, why don't we start with you, Greg? Sure, yeah, happy to. So thanks for having me. I, um, I spent the bulk of my career in electronic trading. I started um, in the early 90s, actually, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. My background's in, in uh, computer science. But I, I found myself on the floor um, trying to help automate systems. And um, more by sheer luck, happened to be at the very beginning of a period of electronification of equities markets that I was very fortunate to, to get to witness. Um, that carried me through two acquisitions. That was a startup company uh, where I, I ended up landing up at Goldman Sachs, uh, where I spent 13 years running the institutional trading business there. Um, again, mainly focused in helping large institutions automate their trading, shave transaction costs. Um, started in equities, and then later in my career, I ended up um, you know, in fixed income and foreign exchange and, and other things. And so. What I found in crypto uh, super interesting is a lot of parallels with respect to the, um, the maturation of the market, what happens to spreads, what happens to technology, you know, how you go about um, saving money, the end asset owner saving money, um, and getting more returns by using technology. And so that's what um, I was very fortunate to meet two, two co-founders, uh, Jennifer Campbell and Mark Bargava, who'd been in crypto for, for quite a while longer than I had and found that our combination of skills in crypto and traditional markets um, was compelling, and we ended up starting a company called Tagomi um, to bring a lot of those same ideas about how you trade electronically, how you spread your orders out, how you're thoughtful about engaging markets to, you know, to try and save money, ultimately, for your fund, um, and also you know, to try and spend less time on operational tasks um, and more time on investing. Um, and so that's what Tagomi's about. Uh, so my background, I was uh, started at Fidelity uh, in their sell side capital markets business. Uh, spent some time there, and then uh, went over to Bridgewater Associates, uh, where I fo focused mostly in uh, portfolio research um, uh, for for large institutions. Um, and then how I got into crypto. So one of my colleagues at Bridgewater, who actually currently works at Grayscale, which is another company owned by DCG, who owns Genesis. Um, was one of my good colleagues at Bridgewater, and so he actually came into the digital asset space first. Um, basically, got me looking at it, whispered in my ear, kind of right off the bat, and he said, "You know, check out the space, check out the company." Um, and then I basically just got the itch to want to come into a space to kind of rebuild uh, financial markets, the way things work, um, and have kind of that entrepreneurial opportunity. Um, so I joined Genesis um, a little less than two years ago now. Um, focused, you know, first as just kind of a research associate for Genesis, thinking about what new business opportunities might be on the horizon for us. So this was back in May of 2017. Um, and a natural kind of segue into our OTC trading business was to kind of start a true institutional lending, spot lending desk. Um, you know, at the time, you know, it was basically the, the height of the bubble. Um, folks were kind of thinking about shorting and, and getting a two-sided market. And so we started kind of uh, business planning of how, how we could do this. Would we use our own balance sheet? Would we have to borrow away? And basically what securities lending would look like in digital assets. Um, and then formally launched Genesis Capital, which is the lending entity of Genesis, uh, in March of 2018. So it's just been just about a year since we've launched. Um, and I run kind of the day-to-day -day on the lending side. And so, you know, something that I think would be helpful for the audience to understand is just what the universe of infrastructure could look like. You know, mm -hmm. what, are, what are all the different types of infrastructure that a mature market, you know, something like equities, has. Uh, because obviously, you know, the crypto market infrastructure is not as mature, but it, let's compare with the gold standard, you know, like mm -hmm. let's say US equities markets. Right. 
and then you know, we'll talk a little bit about you know, what the infrastructure in crypto looks like, and we can talk about the delta. So why don't we start with um, you know, just like, what are some of the infrastructure components that exist in mature markets that uh, the average person just like doesn't see, doesn't know, doesn't realize, but they're really powering everything on the back end? Right. So there actually are quite, um, quite a few of the same things in crypto and in, and in say, equities markets, but they're, they're at different levels of maturation. So exchanges and dealers and people who commit capital, market makers. There's one big missing piece, which is the idea of central clearing, which I, at some level is anathema to the idea of you know, decentralized finance. But um, that means there's no central credit intermediary that sits in between and ensures that two counterparts to a trade um, will settle um, without issue. And that's a, that's a central piece to you know, how equities work, how trades clear and settle. Um, to, after a trade is done, two counterparts end up facing a clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse ensures that both counterparties ultimately receive their funds or their, their shares. Um, that is, that's the one glaring piece to me that is still outstanding in crypto that, that, that exists in almost every other form of securities, either in treasuries and in, in equities and to a certain degree in foreign exchange. Um, but otherwise, you have exchanges both in crypto and in traditional equities. In crypto, they've grown up very much as retail, uh, retail enterprises. And so therefore, um, they're tailored to and catering to a, a different demographic maybe than, than funds and more institutional players. And that manifests in things like you have to pre-fund your trades, for example. Um, and that introduces a whole raft of technical challenges when you're trying to aggregate and smart route and, and make sure that you have enough cash and coin in the right places at the right times. Um, but otherwise, you know, the exchanges are the same. They the fundamentally operate the same way. The technology, I think, underneath, in the case of equities, is designed to handle millions and millions of messages a second. I think crypto doesn't yet require that. Um, ultimately, someday may, and, and you know, there were issues uh, during the spike um, over the course of, of 2017, 2018, with volumes where they are, you know, I, I don't think you're seeing those issues. But you could very well, if we go through a period, a sell-off, for example, um, or you know, a major spike in in um, in activity. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the same pieces are there, but need to mature in those ways. Yeah, I think I, I generally echo that sentiment. I think, I mean, looking at uh, other asset classes and equities as kind of a mental model for what crypto infrastructure would be, I think makes sense. Um, at the end of the day, it's really, it's, it's the same kind of buy side institutions that are gonna be driving what needs to mature in the space. It's the same folks that are gonna want exposure to this as you know, either just an asset class in their beta portfolio or they wanna you know, seek alpha and kind of you know, arbitrage these markets. And so they're gonna need kind of the same tools and infrastructure that they would in any asset class. Um, I think you know something that's interesting is like sure there, there's a lot of parallels. I think there's obviously functioning exchanges, um, which are obviously doing more volumes now, um, and there's more liquidity on them than there were a year ago. Um, but it's I find it interesting. There's still like a, a huge OTC market in um, in digital asset trading right now that doesn't really exist in equities. I mean it does exist in other you know less liquid assets like you know corporate credit or other fixed income um, you know bonds and. Uh, and instruments, but it's because of the kind of illiquidity on exchanges and the price impact that would exist if institutions are moving large orders, that there is a, this need for OTC flow where there's just a natural kind of bid offer in that in the OTC market that doesn't kind of crush the, the exchange like, um, you know, if, if someone was to put that order on exchange. Um, so I think that's kind of a, an interesting difference. Um, and then, you know, I think other things that need to kind of still strengthen or evolve is you know, you look at the equity markets, there's, there's a whole kind of suite of derivative products out there. Um, there's, you know, a booming futures market that still is somewhat lagging uh, in, in digital assets. So, um, you know, there, there's definitely traction there, like CME volumes are definitely increasing. There was a big day there the other week. Um, I think they actually like eclipsed Binance's 24 hour trading volume for the first time in, a, in I think ever. Um, but I, th I still think those, they need to come uh, much further. Um, and then, you know, I think another big missing piece is, is kind of, you know, for hedge funds to have some sort of prime services offering. Um, so having all these services, execution, financing, borrowing, and kind of one spot um, that allows them to accomplish whatever they're looking to do and get leverage and, um, and get borrow um, and have kind of portfolio administrative tools 
um, actually good reporting and audit trails, and I, say, I still think all of that kind of institutional infrastructure and kind of packaging is missing. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there definitely are parallels, and I, th I think it's coming, it's coming along. I think that's right. The other thing I would point to, so this is one of the areas where I think there are some parallels to, there's some historical things that are sort of repeating themselves. So after the dot-com crash uh, in 2000, you know, leading up to that, um, NASDAQ trading, for example, was a very dealer-oriented market. And you know, I, when I was at Goldman Sachs, there was a room of 400 people that um, you know, were manually saying, I'll, I'll buy and sell Microsoft and Intel. By the time I left, um, and I hope none of you were NASDAQ traders out there, um, there were three left. And you know, I think you probably could have done it with two uh, you know, if you tried hard. <laughs> um, and you know, that, that arc um, is the same thing that happened in almost every other asset class. So it happened in treasuries. If you looked at the interdealer market in treasuries, how on the run treasuries trade, um, it was the same thing. It was largely a manual process that became a very automated process. The same thing happened in the, the interdealer market in FX. The only place it hasn't happened so far is in corporate credit, but that's, it's coming, and I think they know that's coming. Um, but you know, that arc kind of looks, you know, it happened over a decade in equities. It took a couple of years in, in interest rate products, and it took even shorter, I think, in FX. So I think it's already, you know, we're already far along in that curve in terms of how liquidity is provided, who's providing it. Um, a lot of the folks that started as, that were early in making markets electronically in equities, and then in all of these other asset classes have moved en masse into, uh, into crypto. And I think that has the effect of taking spreads from hundreds of basis points to tens of basis points. You know, your average S&P 500 stock has a spread of about two bips, um, and you can buy and sell millions of dollars you know, on the quote. And I think that's where, that's where at least the liquid products are going um, on exchange for, um, for the, you know, the top of the liquidity spectrum of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think that, that complex, I think the derivative products, the ETFs, all of those things form a basis and benchmark for everything else that happens, which isn't to say that you know, OTC and high-touch trading isn't, um, it, it, it provides an extremely useful function, but I, I do think over time you're gonna see crypto follow the same arc that the rest of these other asset classes have. So uh, on that same line, you know, uh, both of you are working on companies that are helping mature the crypto market infrastructure specifically. What are some of the biggest barriers that you face? You know, what, what makes this hard? Why isn't it done already? Uh, why don't I have a prime broker that I can go to and just not think about infrastructure at all? Right. Uh, well, I think, so that's a great question. I, I think um, part of what we set out to do is to hide a lot of those operational details and also to be, you know, w when we looked at the space at the beginning of 2018, if you wanted to directly own crypto yourself, the amount of work you would have to do to smart route to a bunch of different places engage potentially multiple um, dealer relationships, uh, make sure that you were able to settle all of those trades and that you had a, a place to bring your crypto back to that you vetted and was safe and secure and so forth. I mean, that's a, that's a long list of stuff when you're really supposed to be picking, um, you know, picking assets and so forth. And so what we set out to do was to package that all together so you could face one counterparty who would then use algorithms and smart routing and a lot of the same techniques that you have in other asset classes to provide you know, electronic access directly to markets. And work with others on the custody side of things, we, um, but make it seamless from beginning to end. And I think that's, um, you know, a, a, we saw it as a, a critical piece of missing infrastructure and also along the way to, to sort of position yourself as the client's agent um, so that we're always acting on the client's behalf. Um, was sort of the, that was the basis of the Tacoma business model. Yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting question because I think, um, yes, like it, it is challenging, it's hard, there are barriers to, to do this well, um, which, I'll, which I'll get into in a sec, but I, I think also it's, it hasn't been that, that obvious to build this until recently. So it's, if you look back a year ago, like the demand for a prime broker for like having a one-stop shop for execution and institutional trading and digital assets, 
was barely just starting to kind of come to fruition. Um, so I, do, I still think it's really early, and I think those who are st starting to build towards that now are, are doing it early on. Um, so I think that's an important thing to note. Um, and then with that being said, like to actually do it well, there are certainly barriers, and I think it has to do with the components of what you actually need, the actual foundation. Um, and so I think one of them is like experience in trading these markets um, and an actual plan to do that. If, you, if you're going to be a prop trading desk, you need to actually know how to be a prop trading desk. If you're going to be agency, you need, you need a really good background in, in actually electronic trading and algorithmic trading um, and order routing. Um, so the trading pieces, if you look across the space, like how many firms out there really have that bread and butter and can do that well in these markets, it's, it's only a handful of, of folks. Um, and then secondly, you, you, know, you also need to figure out custody. You need to figure out how you're actually gonna hold customer assets and do that well. And again, because the infrastructure is so new and there's only you know, a small subset of players that can offer that service, you have to be really wise with who you choose. Uh, and then lastly, like financing is a huge part of being a prime broker and being um, you know, a service provider. And I think you know, to actually do that in these markets is, is also really new. I mean, I think the first lend we were one of the first lenders in the space and that was a year ago. Um, and there's still maybe only a handful that can probably count them on one hand that can actually offer you know, digital asset borrow in large size and kind of run a securities lending book. Um, and then on top of that, kind of the cash lending side as well. Um, and then kind of overhanging all of that is how do you do that in a kind of compliant way, um, you know, do that in a, in, a, in a smart way from a regulatory perspective, um, which are also building blocks and you kind of have had to have thought that through from the beginning. And so Genesis, we're, you know, from the early days, we started as a broker dealer called uh, Second Market. Um, and then that was sold to NASDAQ in, I think, 2012 by Barry Silbert. Um, and then we turned into Genesis to focus on Bitcoin. But we actually were able to kind of keep our broker dealer intact to uh, really be the first and only broker dealer that trades digital assets OTC. Um, so from the beginning, we were thinking about regulation and how that would evolve over time. Um, but I think those kind of joining, joining late and trying to do this are going to have a, a hard time kind of figuring out what regulatory structure makes sense and kind of have, how to navigate all that on both a state and federal level. Um, so yeah. So are there, any th are there any things that you can think of that are just fundamentally different about crypto and about these digital assets that will mean that the eventual mature market infrastructure looks different mm -hmm. than it does in other markets? Or do you think that, you know, actually it's going to look extremely similar at the end of the day, whether I'm buying a share of Apple or whether I'm, uh, whether I'm buying a Bitcoin, like, it doesn't really matter, um, you know, obviously, other than custody, which I think is, is a clear answer, right? Is there anything else that's actually different? Um, so I've heard this um, thesis articulated a few different times, a few different ways, but that ultimately this probably is a very decentralized architecture with respect to how you trade and, um, and that distributed exchanges and so forth ultimately take hold. But this form of it all is sort of a stepping stone in that you know, on its way to that architecture, that this, this, that crypto just by, by its nature wants to be a distributed um, infrastructure. But to get there and to have the on ramps and to have people, you know, be able to, um, you know, to, to invest requires um, the infrastructure that we're talking about right now, um, and probably also requires some form of settlement and clearing and and some other things that are still missing. Um, but I think this may not be the final form. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the past, but I don't think, I don't think that crypto ultimately ends, up, ends looking just like equities or just like you know, treasuries or just like anything else. Um, but I think there's a lot to be borrowed that you can use to reduce frictional costs and to uh, aggregate exchanges and sort of patterns of other things um, that, are, that can be leveraged. Yeah, I think that I generally agree with that sentiment as well. Um, I think, for the most part, I think you know, in the in the at least short to medium term, the infrastructure will look pretty similar uh, in in kind of the institutional crypto trading arena as it does in other asset classes in terms of who the players are, who the service, like what the service providers can offer. Obviously, there's going to be nuances that come with that just because of the nature of, of digital assets versus traditional assets. Um, I mean, you think of things like just a 24-7 trading market in general is, is crazy, and it's new, and it's, <laughs> it's exciting, but you have to basically operate at a totally different pace and set your infrastructure up to handle that, and I think that's a, a game changer. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, settlement in, in kind of the traditional space is like T plus two, and most settlement now is basically T plus zero uh, on kind of the spot trading side, at least, um, at least in the OTC realm. 
And I think people are kind of coming to expect faster settlement as well. And, and, it, and you kind of need it when the volatility is what it is. Um, and then other nuances, I think, you know, things like hard forks and 51% uh, attacks, like you don't have to think about those kinds of things uh, in the equities world. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about our, you know, standard master loan agreement, which is similar to a securities lending agreement. You know, we had to think about, you know, kind of in the first draft of that is what are, like, what are the nuances? How do we bake them into this agreement from a legal perspective so that we have recourse um, if there is a hard fork? What does that look like? Who, who's entitled to the fork coin? Um, and I think there's going to be, you know, things like that that evolve that you just have to be nimble enough to kind of embed in your infrastructure and think through. And you can obviously try to do that up front and kind of anticipate what those are just given the nature of, of the space. But uh, I think a lot of that is, is through iteration over time. Um, but generally, I think the, the infrastructure will look kind of similar from a trading perspective. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think that makes sense. It's just, you know, trading is trading, yep. right? But there are, there are these nuances. And so just building on that, uh, do you think that, um, you know, let, let's fast forward like 10 years. Do you think that the entrance of some of these giants into the space with ICE you know, releasing BACT and TD Ameritrade and some of these other brokers going working together on ARISX. We have, obviously, the CME futures. Uh, CBOE killed theirs recently. But mm -hmm. you know, we, have, we have these traditional institutional players that uh, are entering this space. And then, obviously, we have all of these crypto-native exchanges and crypto-native firms that have really built up from their retail roots. I, I would consider them like kind of like bottom-up. And then we have these like top-down giants that are coming in, and they realize this opportunity. Um, how do you see that playing out and the dynamics between those two? You know, because I, I think it's pretty clear that the crypto-native firms will understand these, some of these aspects that you were just talking about a little bit right. better. But then these institutional firms have some advantages as well. So right. curious for your thoughts there. Yeah, I think um, it's, an, it's an interesting thing to try and, and, and kind of play out. And, and, and in terms of the timing of when this happens, it, it could be in the next three years, it could be in the next 10 years. Um, you know, my take on it is I think, like you're saying, the crypto native firms have the experience. They have all the expertise. They know who the kind of key players are. They know what the current infrastructure looks like. Uh, they've built products around it. They know where the capital pools actually are. And, it, and, and that looks totally different. Um, in terms of like who actually owns the wealth, like where are the Bitcoin, who, which exchanges trade the most volume. Um, but with that being said, like at the end of the day, the balance sheet of some of these firms that might want to come into the space and, and kind of scale their business models around digital assets will likely be enough to totally disrupt the, the kind of existing firms there. And you know, when I think about how that plays out, you know, I think it's a lot of strategic partnerships, um, whether it's a bank partnering with someone like a Genesis or a DCG to figure out uh, exactly, you know, the role that Genesis could play in kind of a larger, you know, bulge bracket. Um, so that it could be, you know, strategic partnerships. It could be aqua hires, like acquiring the people that um, kind of know the space and, and basically just umbrelling them up into the larger kind of entity that's that's purchasing the smaller one. Um, or it could just be direct competition where these exchanges and kind of crypto native firms become big enough and build their balance sheets and reputations large enough to actually compete with some of the, you know, the, the larger institutions and financial services firms that, you know, are, are going to actually start out as, as the underdog. Um, I, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility either. Um, so those are kind of the three scenarios I see happening. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm not sure either side has sort of monopoly on the, the right ideas. And sort of the, you know, if you looked at the, the um, staffing of Tagomi, we're sort of half from traditional markets and half, you know, crypto natives and so forth. And we, you know, it, it lends to a lot of good, healthy debates about sort of the path forward. Um, you know, but I would say if, again, if going back and looking at how other markets mature, there were a couple of guiding principles. Number one, was competition. And so I think throwing all of these things into a market and saying let the best ideas win in a very transparent marketplace is, is the right idea. Um, and the second is, is transparency. And so you know how, for example, equities markets went from the New York Stock Exchange dominating 80% of that market to you have 13 places and they're absolutely clobbering each other to compete on fees. Um, to have market makers that want to be at the, you know, the top of the, the quote and at the inside market was to have transparent bids and offers that were displayed and to let people compete. And as a result, market makers um, just really went after each other to, be, to narrow spreads. And the ultimate beneficiary of that was 
was end asset owners uh, who got to trade with with minimal spreads and and uh, and enter an exit very quickly. And so I think with those as sort of guiding principles, um, you know, we'll see who who wins. But um, I, I'm not sure either of those. Um, I could predict which of the two would, would win in that scenario. So let me then take that question and make it a little bit more complicated for you. Uh, let's add in a third category, which are decentralized market infrastructure, right? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about decentralized exchanges um, and uh, you know, one of the largest exchanges in the world or the largest spot trading exchange in the world, Binance, just launched their decentralized exchange this week. Um, and other exchanges are also experimenting with these types of decentralized technologies. And not only exist in crypto exchanges, but also we're seeing you know, just like native protocols, things like Uniswap or Compound, some of these native decentralized applications that are also competing for a space uh, for market share in this market infrastructure. Uh, you know, what kind of a role do you think those types of players will, will play and um, what will, the competition that they provide kind of force the other market participants to evolve to? It's a good question. Um, and it's obviously something that we're kind of thinking through as well. Um, the way we kind of think about this is knowing kind of your market and the level of kind of comfort in terms of where they're at. Um, so Genesis obviously caters to institutions, mostly hedge funds, trading firms, uh, other financial institutions. Um, or just kind of corporations that, that operate in, in kind of the digital asset space. Um, and, and then obviously we want to make our, make our product and offering um, attractive to the, the future wave of institutions that, that might enter the space and, and what services they might need. And when I think about like, you know, folks trying to put on a $5 million position or $5 million short or get a $10 million loan, um, and they're used to traditional capital markets, I think it's a really hard thing to justify using kind of DeFi platforms, especially in, in kind of the lending and rates market for now, um, until maybe that level of comfort just radically changes over time because the people in the seats at those institutions are changing and they get more comfortable with that kind of system and environment. And for now, I don't think that it's there yet, at least on the institutional side. I think the DeFi platforms uh, like a Dharma or Compound will certainly service um, you know, high net worth individuals, retail, and I, I think there will be a lot of kind of volume uh, on those platforms. But from a inst true institution perspective, I think they're going to expect a higher touch model. Uh, but that's not to say that that high touch model shouldn't leverage kind of whatever technology it can to make that kind of experience as efficient as possible. Um, but I think it's the kind of relationships and business first. Um, that level of trust with a reputable counterparty uh, goes a long way in, in kind of the institutional trading and, and lending space. Um, but I, I do think without kind of overlaying a really great tech product on that um, and basically utilizing and leveraging what is available and, and, and kind of um, like ready to deploy in this space would be you know, misguided. So I, th I think it's a combination of, of high touch, trust, and then great technology overlaying that. But I don't think that the institutional market is ready to strip out that layer yet. Um, in terms of like how that plays out over the next five to 10 years, I think that needs to be on the forefront of uh, you know, our minds and, and Tagomi's minds and, you know, how we evolve our businesses to um, basically sustain that and how do we either partner, acquire, and, or transform our own business models to, to, you know, evolve as the market evolves. Um, but it's really just a matter for us of, of listening to our customer base um, and thinking about, you know, how we partner with them to, you know, allow them to achieve what they're looking to achieve. And from what I'm hearing now, it's, it's, it's not yet fully DeFi. I, I agree. I, I think in the here and now, um, most of these would have trouble scaling. But I, you know, I think so. Our point of view, at least on the exchange side of things, is we're very exchange agnostic. We're we're um, ready, willing, and able to, um, you know, subject to understanding risks and counterparty risks and and all these sorts of things. Uh, we would love to engage DEXs uh, in the same way that we engage central limit order exchanges. Um, but the spreads right now are quite wide, and they're wide because um, there's a lot of frictions, and there's delays, and there's you know your ability to enter and cancel an order. Like you, you will widen spreads naturally if you can't cancel an order quickly, and knowing that you may have to honor a bid or an offer for a longer period of time. Um, and so, until some of those frictions reduce, until some of the scaling issues reduce, 
spreads relative to other limit order exchanges are naturally going to be much wider. And until that happens, it just doesn't make sense for us to engage them on behalf of customers. But we're definitely, you know, as that changes, because it does help solve a lot of the counterparty risk and credit and other concerns that come up in, um, you know, when facing lots of different counterparties and lots of different exchanges. So being able to hold on to your crypto but still engage and trade is a, is a real game changer. So, you know, I think that's coming. I don't know if it's a year or two years, but somewhere in that time frame, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, be surprised if a deck showed up on your Tagomi post trade. Um, yeah, and actually, to to kind of you know, to that point, I think the key thing there is is, you know, if Tagomi is ready to route to a, to a dex, or if Genesis is ready to interact with a Dharma or compound um, for like on behalf of their counterparties. But the key notion there is that the counterparty is still facing you. It's, they're still facing right. us because there's that layer that's kind of necessary, I think, for them at this point in kind of in where the market's at. So you can go ahead and aggregate all of sure. that liquidity or aggregate all of the, the various infrastructure um, and provide that to your counterparties. Sure. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, also, along the same lines of you know, what the competitive landscape looks like and, and how this matures, um, crypto is a really international phenomenon, right? Um, with actually the majority of activity doesn't even happen here in the United States. And so how do you look at international opportunities facing international counterparties or also international competition from firms that you know, maybe in other jurisdictions or um, may, might have less restrictions um, mm -hmm. on them? And how do you think that affects the, the market infrastructure as a whole? Does it, does it help it advance faster or does it actually reduce trust because you, know, you don't ne actually know exactly how things might work out in a very deterministic way? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, and so for Genesis, you know, we've we've always faced uh, counterparties globally. So since we started trading in 2013, um, you know, we've been able to trade uh, literally. And I think we're, right now we're trading in over with counterparties in over 80 countries. Um, and so, you know, what, what that meant for us in the beginning was having a really robust kind of KYC program. Um, you know, as a broker dealer, as an SEC fin regulated entity, we needed to obviously make that really robust. Uh, but we do kind of face counterparties globally. We we do you know we trade volumes. We see the vol we see the flows from global counterparties. We trade on you know exchanges not based in the U.S. Um, and and same same on the lending side. I mean I think you know the answer is kind of simple. I think it's really more flows, more volumes, more involvement, especially at the institutional level uh, globally, is only good for the space. I think it just breeds you know more competition, breeds tighter spreads, better rates uh, for the actual borrowers or the traders. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's just a matter of kind of getting used to the, the way you know the way the way business is done differently uh, overseas and here in the U.S. But um, I, I don't see much friction there, honestly. I think that's right. I, you know, the, we um, you know you have to think about uh, risk, counterparty risk, clearly, um, and how you go about assessing that. Um, there's sort of the, one of the larger issues is sort of jurisdictional arbitrage and, and regulatory issues around operating in the U.S. versus operating outside the U.S., um, in New York versus not in New York, things that are security tokens versus not security tokens. Um, and so all of the sort of, it's more of, I think, a regulatory issue than it is, and a risk issue than it is a technology issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, being set up as a firm to be able to engage uh, what clients demand um, but understanding what is and isn't possible in each jurisdiction is is a lot of work, um, and it's probably something if you know consumes an awful lot of cycles uh, for firms like ours at the moment, trying to figure out um, how to navigate that in a compliant way, but satisfy clients' demands, um, you know, is is a challenge. Yeah, and to that point too, I think you have to have like risk management processes, regulatory you know, risk management processes in place that are kind of country agnostic um, so that you are set up and basically kind of run the same play, whether you're facing someone in the US or facing someone globally, they just kind of go through a process of saying, is this a kind of party we can do business with? Um, how, should we think about risk differently? If so, like what are the ways we're gonna mitigate it? But kind of having that set up ahead of time, I think makes it a, a pretty seamless process. All right, so let's, uh, let's go fast forward into the future a little bit. You know? What do you think the world will look like when we do the Spring 2020 Summit here? You know, what, from a market infrastructure perspective, you know, what new products do you think will be available? Yeah. Uh, what, 
what kind of change do you think we should expect in terms of spreads and rates? Yeah. Um, so which year again? Some color. Oh, 2020. 2020, yeah, okay. just think one year ahead. So I do think you'll have an ETF. Um, I think that uh, an ETF will uh, draw in a whole lot of other interest, and it will begin what you already have the start of in the form of a derivatives complex with futures, a more liquid options um, uh, marketplace. Um, and so the complex of different ways for somebody to gain exposure, I think, will be much broader than it is today, particularly for the liquid products. Um, you know, I do think that spreads which have been under pressure for the last year um, will continue to be so uh, until you get to the point where they're in the single digit basis points for you know, size bids and offers. In, again, at least in the liquid products. I think the less liquid products um, rightfully remain wider with wider spreads because you're warehousing risk and, you're, and I don't think that changes ever. I think that remains that way uh, in perpetuity. Um, you know, but I, I think that you'll, if volumes continue to be low, um, as they have been post the sort of the sell-off um, and so forth, I do think you'll see um, some mergers and some acquisitions and things that will force some consolidation because there's a lot of duplicated infrastructure and things around between exchanges. Um, and I think there will be ultimately, I think if you looked at exchange fees today relative to what they are, so you know the top of the rack rate being 20 to 30 basis points, um, relative, again, to U.S. equities where it's a fraction of a basis point. Um, there's a fairly wide spread there that I think will ultimately come down pretty dramatically, and I, th I think ultimately there will be a price war there. Whether that happens in the next year or not is kind of hard to say, but I, I think it will. Yeah, I think at a high level, um, I don't think you're going to, you know, in a year from now look back and say there was, there was really drastic change in terms of the infrastructure that's being built and kind of the roadmap for the folks building it. Um, but I think just rather just kind of slow and steady progress for the next year and, and the firms that are actually doing things successfully will reinvest in their businesses, um, kind of build their moat, um, you know, their, their, their value drop and competitive advantage will become obvious and, and they'll continue to kind of take market share. Um, I think for spreads, like I, I agree, I think they're definitely going to continue to be under siege. Um, I mean, last year, I think, you know, OTC desks were basically quoting a percent, you know, 75 bips to a percent wide on, <laughs> on you know, million dollars of Bitcoin or, or ETH, uh, could be even wider for ETH. And then, you know, if you look now, we're basically at 10 to 20 bips off of, yeah. off of spot. So, um, I mean, that's, that's a huge reduction in spread in, in a little less than a year. Um, and I think that will just kind of continue to, to tighten. Um, in terms of lending rates and, and kind of the lending market, I actually think it will be a, a slightly different. Um, I think there's an interesting kind of dynamic that's playing out right now. I think um, a lot of folks are, are new lenders in the space, see kind of the opportunity in, in, in financing, and whether it's margin financing on the cash side or securities lending. Um, and so they're basically you know, willing to make no money and go out and kind of acquire, just acquire new users or acquire um, you know, borrowers across the space, whether it's retail or institutional. Um, but, I'm, but I also am kind of seeing like, there's, in terms of the sophistication of how do you actually price risk, um, what should interest rates actually be from a risk return perspective, I think that thinking is still evolving um, just because of how different the actual asset is, the volatility uh, and liquidity characteristics of digital assets relative to traditional assets. Um, and so I think there's this, this constant dy dynamic of, I'm gonna enter the space, we see the opportunity here, we need to build fast and kind of acquire users. Um, and so we can sacrifice on kind of rate there and spread, but. I do think in a year from now you're going to look back and, and there's going to be actually probably not that many more lenders in the space because some of them will kind of go belly up and make a bad loan. People will default um, because we've been in a bear market for the last year or so. Um, the actual kind of defaults have been less. The delinquencies have been then, you know, less than what you'd expect. Um, but in the next kind of bull market, that could change drastically. And then anybody who's made a bad loan or isn't managing collateral well and counterparty risk well could easily get blown up. And I, I think that that will happen. Um, I think it will probably shock the, the rates market a bit in terms of like, are you pricing risk well? Um, just based on where other assets price and hard to borrow equities, you know, rates on Bitcoin borrowing and Ether borrowing are actually seen too low. They, just, they don't really, um, I think, price the volatility well. 
Um, but I think it takes one of these events to actually normalize that um, and kind of have, have folks understand that and learn to price it better. Um, and then, uh, you know, outside of kind of spreads, I think, you know, in a year from now, I, I agree, I think we'll see an ETF. Um, I think that will bring in kind of new capital. Um, and I think you'll start kind of seeing more of these like inst institutional focused shops, whether it's prime services or more institutional exchanges like back to RSX. Um, and so I think that thesis will play out kind of over the next year. So, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, the other thing, I, I do think sometime in the next 12 to 18 months, somebody will step into this fold of um, being able to do an atomic settlement of cash and crypto, um, which is one way to help mitigate um, counterparty risk and help manage counterparty risk that right now there's a lot of you go first kind of settlement, which isn't a great, uh, which isn't a great way to, um, you know, to face counterparties and um, very little in the way of automated escrow type settlement and so forth. And so that, you know, strikes us as a pretty good big gap that somebody's going to step into. Um, as a first form, it you know will be bilateral, but as a second form, there'll be credit intermediation and other ways for people to um, help manage that credit risk. That's that's a really interesting point, actually, and um, it kind of ties back to some of the themes that we've been talking about through the earlier programming, where I think um, you can kind of do that today almost if you use something like USDC, you mm -hmm. know, on these fiat coins. Backs with the dollar in the bank account, you know everything's KYC, all regulated. Um, and if the asset that you that you want to buy lives on the Ethereum blockchain, you can use something like a zero X swap type contract, mm -hmm. and you can you can have that trustless settlement today. So, I think um, I think that prediction is probably spot on, just because we need to see more adoption of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, when we go as Multicoin and we interact with a an OTC desk, you know that would be that would be very exciting for us be able to say, oh, actually, we're going to use a trustless swap for this instead of having to do the, the you go first type system. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and kind of ask uh, the last question that I had for you guys and then open up to the audience for questions. Um, one of the themes that we've talked about a lot with you know, some of the people here and talked about at our last summit is kind of the great talent migration coming from the traditional finance world, you know, places like Goldman, like Bridgewater, coming over here into the crypto um, economy. Um, and, you know, I would just, this isn't really related to, to market infrastructure, but, you know, you guys both have great backgrounds in the traditional financial world. I'm curious if you could share, you know, what, what do you think is drawing all of these people over? Um, and how, how long do you think this trend is going to continue, this giant talent migration coming over from these traditional institutions over into this, you know, wild, wild west world. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first on that one. I think, um, I mean, just thinking back to my own kind of thought process about making the switch over and, and kind of, um, you know, making that career change. Um, I think it's, I mean, I think it's really going to differ on a person by person basis, obviously. Um, but the, for me, it was, so the first thing that I kind of um, did was, Go, go see the firm, like go actually talk to Genesis, talk to DCG, figure out what they were doing. Um, and so, and then, so I think there's, there's two pieces. There's the content of like what the space has to offer, which is, I mean, you know, it's, it's super intriguing. Um, it's, the con it's the idea and the notion of like reshaping financial markets and basically everyone is an entrepreneur. Um, everybody is, is building in the space. They're building towards something because it's not efficient. So the fact that this market's not efficient and that so much has to be built, I think, is a huge draw to anybody that has ambition, is an entrepreneur, is high-powered, has um, you know, a lot of horsepower, and they want to go actually shape something and actually get their hands dirty and, and you know, put their mind and, and kind of energy into something that um, you know, has, a lot of, has a lot of room to grow and, and be shaped. Um, so it's literally that. And I think in traditional markets, it's like you have to really get creative to figure out how you're going to kind of change something or add value that's not already efficient or already existing. Um, not saying that that can't be done, but I mean, even at Bridgewater, it's a 1,500-person firm. Their trading signals and strategies was so well thought out already. And so like to, to, to actually have impact at a firm like that, I mean, you have to really be super creative. Um, and I think you know, that obviously happens, but it's much easier to just apply that energy here where there's just so, it's, it's so much more raw. Um, and there's, there's so much to actually do and construct. 
So it's it's just the it's it's the characteristic about the market I think that draws a lot of people, uh, and then there's just a lot of similarities to how the how the infrastructure is going to build out that we've been talking about, where people with expertise from financial markets can you you know utilize their abilities and skills um, and kind of you know see the parallels and actually have an impact here um, and kind of realize that pretty quickly. Um, so I think that that's a, a big draw, and then. Um, you know, for me also is the way that I'd be engaging with kind of the the the, the industry is is very much in an entrepreneurial way and you know in a, in a shaping kind of um, manner. Um, so I think anybody that thinks like that and wants to do that would naturally be drawn to the space. I think that was a great summary. I uh, I would uh, it was many of the same things for me. It was um, I spent my entire career in other forms of securities, and you do get the feeling that you're helping people shave the last fraction of a basis point out of a transaction cost, that you've hit the end of the earth and there's kind of no more worlds to conquer, which of course isn't true, but um, that was sort of the perspective. But here's a, here's a space that's just um, poised to potentially explode. Um, and everywhere you look, there's something um, that needs to be built that clients will, will want and would find useful and is purposeful and, and um, and to your point, to the entrepreneur, that's, you know, that's uh, an amazing opportunity to be early stage in something where you can, in this sunk cost fallacy, maybe not you know, toss out you know, years of experience, but bring some of that with you, but do something um, new and exciting. Um, and uh, you know, where the learning curve is kind of the steepest is personally where I, you know, I uh, enjoy things the most. And you know, with uh, coming to work every day, I feel like I learned 50 new things. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. Yeah. I, I just love the selection effect that that, that, that enables. There's a self-selection that happens, right? Because you're completely right. It's, it, there's so much opportunity to do more. And so I think the people that are coming over into this industry from the traditional financial services world really are the people who have that ambition, who are entrepreneurial, who really want to add more value. And you know, that's, that's one of the things I love about this industry is because that's exactly who I want to work with every yeah. day. So yeah. thank, thank you, both of you, for, for joining us on stage. I want to open it up for questions from the audience uh, at this point. I've got the, uh, the first one from Telegram Group, um, from Kareem. For Tagomi, what's your extra strategy and timeline? <laughs> 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 Next question. <laughs> Sorry. I, the honest answer is I, I have no idea. I don't know. Is there an investor in the audience, by the way? I'm sorry. Um, so there's all these different exchanges around the world Coinbase, Binance, Bitrex, Bitfinex, Bitmax, whatever. Why is it that? Price discovery seems to happen on some exchanges versus others. Like, why? H yeah. How do you guys think about that happening? And then, how does that impact your decisions, both at Genesis and at Tagomi? So, I, you know, it's interesting. I think that um, the same thing happened in other marketplaces too. And um, so, for example, in equities markets, Nasdaq was always the center of price discovery. And in the case of Nasdaq, it was because they had the fastest matching engine. You could enter and cancel orders faster than any place else. And so, as a market maker, you knew. If I was going to make a super tight market in Intel and Microsoft and Oracle, I could do that because I could cancel my order the second I saw S&P futures change or something else happen. And so what happened is their market data and their matching engine and everything sort of gravitated to being the center of price discovery. Now, that's different in crypto because that's not sort of where crypto is. Um, but other things like, um, you know, uh, in the case of BitMEX, I have the ability to um, get leverage and short and do other things. And so, you know, it's very possible for that to become a leader in the lead lag indicators of price discovery in a way that NASDAQ was in the, in the equities world. Um, and so you might find that that price in terms of, you know, being a short-term future indicator is sort of the best forward. Um, that would, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I basically agree. I think it comes down to which exchanges or, or you know or platforms kind of have the, the biggest breadth of what you can do, um, and and what's most accessible. So I think you know Binance is crypto to crypto, and I think there's they just given kind of the barriers of fiat movements overseas. I think it makes it a very easy place to go on, and, and and you'll see price discovery on Binance. And then 
uh, like Greg was saying too, BitMEX, just because you can get leverage there, you can go short, there's perpetual swaps, there's a lot you can do there, and I think it's it's one of the first places you kind of see you know trends and, and kind of uh, is definitely a leader in that sense. So. Um, so I come from a more traditional world, um, and with this price discovery that's going on 24 hours a day, um, how are you seeing, uh, like I'm actually seeing in our worlds a lot of things will, I wouldn't say lazy, but the easy way to do it is just throw your order in for market on close or something like that. Right. Are you starting to see auctions happen near any any of the, I guess, country start days or? Have not, so this is interesting. So we've been asked by um, quite a few clients to look at volume patterns um, and, and ask for a VWAP algorithm, for example. So if you wanted to match the um, if you wanted to match the volume weighted average price around the globe across a whole bunch of exchanges consolidated. Um, but it's challenging because the variance for that is enormous. So there's, there's unlike in equities where you trade 10% of the open and 10% of the close, and it looks like this almost every day, every day is different in crypto. Um, and there are some auctions happening on, on uh, Gemini that are that have some liquidity around future settlement and other things like that, but nowhere near enough, I think, yet to be a single point in time that you can you can find liquidity to go trade. Which is why I think the idea of splitting your orders up, um, you know, not um, you know of of using smart routing techniques and doing other things makes a lot of sense because there just isn't the same aggregation of liquidity both in terms of time of day or at a particular place or anything like that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's very much a case by case kind of time basis. Um, you know, there's time. So Genesis is an OTC trading desk, um, and everything we do is, is kind of market order. So you, you basically put an RFQ in. We give you a price 24 um, seven. And what we do is, you know, for a lot of our institutional counterparties, anytime we're axed in a certain position. So we operate on a principal basis. We actually take you know warehouse risk ourselves, work out of that risk on exchanges, or offlay it to other OTC natural flow on the other side. Um, but when we're acts in a certain way, like that's that's when we kind of get proactive and actually go out to our counterparties and say, hey, we're ax sellers or ax buyers. We can basically offer a large chunk at spot. And so, you know, in terms of value prop, I think that's actually really important for institutions to be able to get access to large blocks of liquidity. Um, you know, at certain points when we're you know when we're kind of positioned that way. Um, and I know other other OTC desks are, are kind of doing similar things. So that provides good kind of pockets of liquidity at at certain times. But in terms of auctions, it's, yeah, I think I've seen that on Gemini. Um, it's really it. Another question here. Um, when we see options, the market seems underdeveloped. That's a good question. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, you know, it does strike me as something that will develop, but it's hard to predict exactly when. Um, you know, there is a nascent OTC options market or derivatives market, um, and we've worked with a couple firms to, you know, on that, uh, who then want to trade spot offsetting that. Um, we're watching Ledger X very carefully, but, you know, hard to say when and how that exactly comes about. Um, but a combination, if you look at um, S&P futures, the ETF, um, options on SPY, things like that. I do think that's going to evolve in the case of Bitcoin and Ethereum specifically. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I mean, there are, there are options. There, is, there, are, there are a couple options exchanges out there. Um, Ledger X is you know, the only CFTC regulated options exchange, but the volumes are basically you know, zero. Um, I, I think it has to do with a function of the demand for them, honestly. Um, like, I, I don't know that the market is is sophisticated enough that it kind of scaled to really trade options. It, it also may have to do with the fact that it's basically 100% collateralized on Ledger X, uh, physically settled. Um, so I think maybe when there's like a cash settled uh, options platform, and I, and I know folks are working on that. Um, Deribit is another options platform that exists, um, not as regulated as as Ledger X, <laughs> um, <laughs> but is still you know I, 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 the volumes there are actually much higher. So. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a matter of time and, and when that kind of use case really becomes apparent enough and demand will just kind of drive that. Um, but I think you're starting to see platforms kind of evolve and emerge that will hopefully capture that, that market share. Um, but yeah, I think it just kind of follows the theme of kind of slow and steady kind of infrastructure growth and it will, it will come. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Nobody? 
All right. Well, thank you both of you for, for joining us. And anyone in the audience, um, you know, if you're interested in talking to them about trading, borrowing, or lending crypto, these are the guys to talk to. So Thanks. highly recommended. Thank you, Thanks. everyone, for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks.